Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences. Such as. I, I would almost welcome adults or other people that we meet to, to ask those several questions like, what do you go through on a daily basis? You know, what is it like? How can you explain it to me so I can understand? And maybe I can help you in certain scenarios that might be stressful and help you get out of that scenario. So, you know, in some scenarios, it, or situations, it would be great if, if others might ask some more questions than just say, okay, accept that, you know? So, but, you know, again, some other people might, might not know how to react to someone telling them that they're having issues and having these, these you know, visible ticks. This is Tourette's podcast, made possible with support of the Tourette Association of America and part of the Geeks Rising Network. Hey, it's Ben. Uh, At one point in the conversation you're going to hear today between me and our guest, Dan, I ask him whether his young children have shown any signs of having something like Tourette. If you didn't know, uh, Tourette appears to pass down through individuals genetically um, in families. So, for instance, a father with Tourette may see signs of Tourette develop in his child. Dan, our guest, is a father, so I asked him about that. And so far, he said he hasn't seen that in his kids, hasn't seen the signs of Tourette in his kids who are of a diagnosable age. He can recall aspects of it elsewhere in his family, but not in his kids at this time. Coincidentally, though... Someone I talk with semi-frequently in the Tourette community right after I recorded this conversation messaged me to say that he is now seeing signs of Tourette in his young son, a five-year-old. So I get a DM from the father that says the following, quote, so my exceptionally precocious five-year-old son just showed me his right middle finger and said, daddy, there's something wrong with my body. Sometimes I put this finger up when I don't want to. He's too young to understand what's going on, but I tried to explain it to him the best I could. So that was a message I received uh, from a father who has Tourette syndrome. And so I asked him how he explained it. I honestly, I don't remember specifically my parents explaining it to me, and I'm sure they did. I just don't remember it. So I was curious how this father explained it to his five-year-old son. And his answer was, quote, I told him that there's nothing wrong with what he's doing because it's not his fault. And that some people like us have brains that are a little different and that's okay. End quote from the father telling his five-year-old son what might be going on. And I asked him if I could share this with you guys, and he was cool with it. I'm still doing it anonymously, but he was cool with me sharing this because, like, I don't have kids. But this was a heavy thing for him to share with me. Basically getting the sign that, yeah, I've dealt with Tourette my whole life, and I know the challenges that come with it, and now my son might have to go through the same stuff. Like, that's heavy. But I thought how he handled it was pretty amazing. He didn't use dire language. He used the word us. He didn't stuff all kinds of fear into it for him, for his son. He just kind of told him a a straightforward truth that some of us have different brains and it's cool. And sure, there might be challenges ahead if it's indeed Tourette, but his son is going to have an amazing guidance with it because his dad knows all about it. That's huge. Regardless, I thought that was a great way to explain it to him. And I wanted to share that because as many of you know, that's a popular question that comes in on the podcast. Like, how do you tell your young child what's going on with something like Tourette? Again, this is the way the father put it. I told him that there's nothing wrong with what he's doing because it's not his fault, and that some people, like us, have brains that are a little different, and that's okay. End quote. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here with the listeners, but you know we do have a lot of new listeners all the time, and people who are getting primed to Tourette syndrome uh, in real time. It's like a live drill. They've their child was just diagnosed, and they found the podcast after after Googling or through the Tourette Association. And so I just wanted to put a positive note on this case of what may be a Tourette diagnosis in the making and how you can handle that as a parent in terms of tone. You can't predict all the challenges that'll come with it, but those challenges also come with rewards. As we talk about on our episode today with Dan, our guest, uh, Dan Horowitz, who was diagnosed as a child in the 90s, a time period when finding community wasn't such an accessible thing. We do talk a little bit about the evolution of community for Tourette through the internet, through, through the podcast, through the discussion group we have on Facebook, and many other discussion groups for uh, people with Tourette through the Tourette Association, sponsor of the podcast. This is a really great conversation about learning ourselves for who we are individually and balancing ourselves with our resources. So let's get right to it. (laughs) 
first off, could you state your name and the general part of the world you live in and, uh, and what you do, just how you would introduce yourself to this audience? Yeah, so I'm, my name is Dan Horowitz. I live in the Western New York area. I was diagnosed with TS uh, when I was in first grade, so around six or seven years old. Um, always had to deal with ticks, whether they were motor or verbal. Um, always had a way to kind of suppress that um, and having some difficulties in doing that, mainly with headaches and, and, and you know, high amounts of stress. But overall, I think um, in, in being an adult now, it's, it's definitely subsided. But I, you know, I have some experiences still that I, I go through, uh, uh, more specifically through high stressful situations. And, um, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a struggle to get through, but it is also uh, good to go through those things and also understand what other people might be going through. So using, you know, Tourette's uh, podcast as a resource or some of the forums has been pretty beneficial for me as of late. Well, that's, that's great to hear. And, you know, uh, saying that your tics have uh, subsided in adulthood a bit, it's, I think Amanda Talty had said this from the uh, Tourette Association that you don't really meet people who say, I used to have Tourette syndrome. It's, you know, it's something that it, you can be diagnosed as a child and, and maybe your tics do kind of subside when you grow up, but it's not an experience that you just leave behind. I mean, it's, it's something that right. still follows you. And, and also with Tourette being so much more than just ticking, you know, there's the Tourette iceberg and there are uh, co-occurring conditions. And so it, it, it goes beyond ticks and it's something that really can stick with you into and through adulthood. Uh, what aspects of it seem to be present uh, in the present day for you? Um, I tend to, well, let me talk with, talk about how I usually suppress some of the ticks and then I can talk about what some of those ticks might be. Um, sure. I typically, what I typically do on the suppressing side of things is I usually hold my breath. Um, <laughs> which doesn't <laughs> seem, you know, kind of, kind of normal, but that usually tends to keep things in, um, you know, closing my eyes sometimes, but, you know, really taking a deep, not, not really a deep breath, but just holding my breath, um, and clenching my jaw is a, is a good way for me to suppress. Now, obviously everyone might suppress some of their ticks a little bit differently, but that seems to, to, to work for what I'm kind of dealing with in, in my personal life, um. But, you know, yeah. there are some stresses, of course, in, in, in you know, our occupation and, um, you know, there's there's friends and family stresses that, that come about every day. So, yeah, a lot of different a lot of different ways that um, I have to suppress. But, um, you know, some of the some of the ticks is, you know, just closing my eyes. They're not so much verbal anymore as they are motor. Um, closing my eyes, again, clenching my my jaw. Um uh, mm-hmm. You know, whether it's closing my eyes or alternately, uh, sometimes when I'm driving, I know when I was a kid uh, and I was I was a passenger in the back seat. I, I know the telephone poles, I would I would blink my right eye in between hmm. each telephone pole. And that was just, a you know, kind of a weird tick that I had. Um, and I and I know <laughs> I know <laughs> I want to tiptoe around talking about my ticks because other people who might be listening to this might pick up on some of those, too. But. Um, that you know, just based on my, <laughs> yeah, just based on my experiences, uh, those are, those are some of the ticks that I've gone through. It's interesting what you said about the, uh, the telephone poles. Cause I do something similar, even in my adulthood where I, I remember I, I used to kind of picture myself running sideways in the air and just hopping over each telephone pole. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's something I still do in my head all the time. And, and I, I don't know if I attribute it to a, like a, a tick or, or what, but it, it's just something I just feel compelled to do. Right. It's, and it's interesting about the jaw clenching and uh, holding your breath. I mean, I've, I've had ticks where I would do both, where I would, you know, I would hold my breath and I would refrain from talking. Refrain right. is the wrong word because I, I just couldn't get it out. But uh, th- that does make me think about how, um, like what I do physically when I'm in a, a situation where I do want to suppress my ticks, say I'm at a meeting with, you know, the higher ups or something like that, right. um, where I will kind of put my hands in this sort of like praying position and then put them between my knees and just kind of squeeze them. Okay. And so something about that, uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't cure the tick for anybody listening, it, but it, it is just something I do when I'm really trying to, to kind of hold it in. Um, what, when you do mask, do, do you find that, uh, d- does it irritate or agitate, um, any part of this for you? Or some people say, you know, it gets worse if you hold in your ticks. 
Uh, yeah, I, I tend to get headaches, uh, frequently. Um, again, the, the, the clenching of my jaw, you know, I get, I get TMJ in my, in my jaw area occasionally. Um, but headaches seem to be a pretty common thing. And then of course, holding your breath, you know, <laughs> you could get a little <laughs> yeah. lightheaded doing that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it gets to the point sometimes in certain high stressful scenarios, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm a sales manager for an equipment manufacturer and, I have to be in front of customers all the time. I have to be on conference conference calls with um, several people, and it can be quite stressful at times. And sometimes I, I I do have to hold my breath in between, you know, whether it's a conversation or you know a slide that I'm showing on the screen. Uh, so it, it it can get pretty tricky, and you know. <laughs> When the meeting ends or yeah. the conference call ends, you know, I, I, I tend to kind of let loose a little bit and kind of let it out as kind of like a full, a full blown out uh, uh, thing. But um, <laughs> right. yeah, some some certain stressful scenarios can can really trigger a lot of those ticks. Is this something that your your coworkers know about? No, you know, I, I, I haven't really shared, um, you know, the the ticks that I have with 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 any of the companies that I've worked for, I'm, I'm on my third company right now. Not, not as a result of my ticks, but, um, mm-hmm. no, it, it never really came up. No one's really questioned it. Um, there was one employee that I was working with right out of college that, that did, you know, kind of make fun of it. And I just kind of shrugged it off and never really explained myself, but I just knew mm-hmm. I had to maybe mask it a little bit more in front of that person. Um, but outside of that, you know, my close family knows about it. You know, some friends know about it. Um, you know, after a couple of a uh, couple of drinks, I might I might talk about it openly a little bit more than I would um, mm-hmm. not having any 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 drinks in me. But um, no, I, I I usually don't talk about it too much unless it it becomes a problem. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting question too because you know, the the subject of disclosure of you know who do I tell how do I how do I explain it you know am I going to put myself at risk in some new way if I try to tell this to people and they don't understand it or we've talked about this in the podcast before where you know it's your health and it's your business and it's your life and you know, no obligation at all to to tell people um, about it right. on the on the flip side there's that sort of thing where you know we should all be advocating and loud and. And th- there's a place in between there where, you know, it's, th- that's where the question is of, um, right. do I really need to tell the people around me who gets to know this about me versus any other health condition I might have? And I put, you know, health condition in quotes, but, um, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, is, is there a way that you've tried to explain it to, to people that you've let in? Like, do you have a certain way of relating it? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if someone might ask a question or maybe not knowing that I have, Tourette's, they may make a comment about someone who, you know, visibly you can see might be having some issues, whether they have uh, a Tourette's or tics or, or whatever it might be. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I will speak up and say, you know, it is a serious condition and I might educate them a little bit more about what I've gone through, but that really hasn't come up a lot. Um, so I haven't really had to deal with that per se. Um, but you know, to other people who might have, um, you know, a lot of issues with, uh, you know, ticks visibly, uh, whether they're, they're motor or visible or, um, uh, motor or, uh, audible, um, having those issues, you know, I, I can, I can see why some, some people might, might feel uncomfortable trying to explain it to others. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it, you have to fight through maybe preconceived notions of what Tourette syndrome is and then, I've wondered about this too. Like after I've told people, like, are they going to regard me differently? Are they going to have like sort of a new layer of, uh, even if I explain Tourette in a way that I feel like is totally clear, uh, it, it, am I going to have some new kind of element following me around with, you know, how they perceive me? Um, that's always been kind of a nervous thing for me, even as an adult. I, I mean, I would say, especially as an adult, because, you know, being a kid with Tourette is, is certainly difficult. Um, adults are really judgmental too. And, sure. you know, it, and, and it's, it's, it's a lot to, to consider. I mean, I've talked with so many people who are adults. They've never told anybody about it. They've never talked with anybody else who has Tourette syndrome. It's, it's just, just something they've kind of packed down inside. And sure. I, I can't disrespect that, you know, that's, that, that's their decision and, and, uh, and, and how they've chosen to go about it. And I think completely fair enough. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, even explaining it to whether they're kids or an adults, 
you know, explaining what, what you're going through, um, you know, the typical response is okay. You know, it's, it's not really, a, it, it doesn't really yeah. bother them that I'm, I'm visibly having an issue or I'm making a tick out loud or, or closing my eyes or holding my breath or anything like that. Um, you know, nail biting, elbow cracking, all those sort of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think it almost puts you at ease a little bit if, if, if they just say, okay, or, or I accept that. And, you know, it's not an issue if, if we're still friends or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. um, it, it's good to get that reassurance that it's okay to be not okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I think people don't necessarily, uh, and I can't really blame them for this. They don't necessarily know how to react, you know, whether it's like the, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you know, that you have to deal with that. Or it's, you know, uh, I, I'd love to learn more about this, you know, like th this is interesting or it, the answer can go so many different ways. I, I would almost welcome um, adults or other people that we meet to, to ask those several questions. Like, what do you go through on a daily basis? You know, what is it like? How can you explain it to me so I can understand? And maybe I can help you in certain scenarios that might be stressful and help you get out of that scenario. So, mm -hmm. you know, in some scenarios, it, or situations, it would be great if, if others might ask some more questions than just say, okay, I accept that, you know? So, um, but, you know, again, some other people might, might not know how to react to someone telling them that they're having issues and having these, these, you know, visible ticks. So you mentioned uh, a little bit of this earlier, but um, when this sort of set on for you, do you have many memories of the the early days of of managing Tourette syndrome? I I do, and I I was thinking about this the other day. I remember being a kid. My father, um, was, you know, we would always do home videos and whatnot, and I had a, a pretty substantial rock and mineral collection as a kid, and. He's like, hey, oh, that's cool. why, don't, why don't we, why don't we set it all up? We'll, we'll do a little show, you know, we'll, you'll show off all the different rocks and minerals and explain what each one is and what, you know, which one you like the most. And I said, sure. You know, I think, um, I think, you know, that sounds, that sounds like a, like a fun idea looking yeah. back on it. Um, you know, it, it was difficult to watch that video because, uh, that was early on when I was diagnosed, I didn't quite know how to suppress. So it was, it was just all out there and, 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 and open for everyone to see. And, and it was, um, it was a little difficult for me to watch that video. I think I've only seen it a few, a few times since we, since we recorded that as a kid, but that was, that was one of my first memories of really, really seeing how, uh, how impactful it was to me as a kid. So, um, what's, I, I can understand how that can be difficult. Uh, what specifically though, was, was it just the rawness of seeing, were you relating to yourself at that time or, like what was difficult about uh, seeing that? Uh, I think it was the fact that I didn't know how to how to suppress. So seeing seeing me being vulnerable and not able to control was a little difficult for me to watch. And even to this mm -hmm. day, um, you know, I, I I do participate in other podcasts and uh, video recordings, and and I just still can't. Um, muster up the the courage to watch watch my own self on a video it's i don't know if it's a, a self conscious issue or what but like i'll notice the different ticks that pop up on video and and it, it's it's a little a little cringe for me to watch in some scenarios but yeah, yeah. it's you know over time you, you certainly learn how to suppress and, and know you know what to do in certain scenarios and um, i think i've just gotten better over time and trying to mask those was there any point in time where uh, you, and this may be just something, you know, kind of slowly built over time, but uh, was there a moment in time where you figured, you know, it's, it's better to just uh, to, to learn how to mask this or, or is that something that you think you were instinctively doing? Uh, school was a, was a big one for me. Um, I don't quite remember early on when I was diagnosed and how I interacted in school. I do remember a couple of different scenarios and situations. I remember being in a summer camp at one point. I, I can't remember what grade I was in, but uh, I believe we were playing either kickball or dodgeball inside in the gym and, and some of the chaperones that were kind of helping uh, uh, kind of guide the game, um, you know, at one point had told me I, I got hit by a ball and I had to go out and I kind of rolled my eyes, but I had always done that. 
So mm-hmm. it, it wasn't like I was doing that as a reactive point of, of kind of being told you got out, you got in trouble or whatever. I right. think, um, I think the chaperone took it as, okay, you're rolling your eyes at me because I told you you had to go sit out. So I'm going to put you on the spot and, and, tell you to sit out and wait after while everyone else leaves the gym after the game was over. And I just remember that was pretty impactful to me because it was the first moment that I realized that uh, even, even if I can control it, I can't control it a hundred percent and that some other people might not understand what I was going through. So even at that young age, I didn't quite understand how to explain myself. So I just kind of froze and just sat there and, and, you know, again, that was, that was one of the bigger, um, events that I remember as a kid. How long was it until, or at least at you know, maybe what age, uh, did your tick start to subside a bit? Yeah, I would say, I would say in high school, closer to either my junior or senior year, I think I started to feel a little more comfortable being in social settings and whatnot. Um, hmm you know, I had, had a good amount of friends, so I felt comfortable around them. Um, and then in college, um, you know, it was a little bit different, obviously, you know, going from high school where you know a majority of the people that, that you're, you're in classes with going to college and it's just a completely different crowd, all different ages. Um, that was, that was a a, kind of a new scenario, but I, I, I think I, I think I had the tools to be successful in college. Um, but when it started, ramping up on the homework side of things and projects and whatnot and tests and preparing for all those sort of things. That's when the stress really started to uh, pick up. And and I actually uh, ended up going and and getting diagnosed of having a learning disorder. So I ended up getting uh, um, um, extra time on tests if I needed it, but I never really fully took advantage of that. Uh, Whenever I had a test, um, I would, I would basically get into the class take the test as quick as I could and get out of there as quick as I can. And, you know, ultimately (laughs) I Hmm. I didn't get good grades. Um, but I was, I was lucky enough to go to a college that we were based on trimesters. So instead of having 15 week semesters, we had 10 week semesters. Hmm. So the number of uh, tests decrease, but the number of projects increase. And that's where I really excelled what were the, were the projects. So less pressure, you had more time to work on it and really do all of your research and so on and so forth, depending on the subject. And that's, that's when I realized that I'm, I'm at a great spot in college. I can really excel by doing, by taking some, some classes that were more geared towards projects than it was tests. And that's when I really started to become successful. That's important for people to hear, I think, because it, it can be really frustrating. And I remember with me too, like I, I was a terrible student, just, just awful. I, I couldn't do it. I, uh, I was terrible at homework. If I got called on in class, I would just lock up because I, you know, my mind was like filled with other things or, or don't, don't call my, don't call my name. Don't choose me. Don't call my name. You know, right. it, it's, it can be really, really frustrating and, and confidence shattering to, uh, to feel like you don't measure up in school, like with your other classmates, I mean, can create huge insecurities. Yeah. And you know, that was, that was the good side of college. (laughs) The other bad (laughs) side of it, the, the, the flip side of that was, I remember having to take an elective course and I chose public speaking. Looking back on it, I have no clue why I picked public speaking. (laughs) Um, Getting into the class the first week, I realized that the final, the final project was to speak in front of the class about a subject or, or whatever it was. I can't remember the exact project, but yeah. that, that was uh, very, um, very difficult for me to get through. Um, but once I got, I got through it, it was a big relief. You know, it was a lot of weight off my shoulders as you can imagine, hmm. but that was, um, that was pretty, pretty stressful. And, and, you know, it, and again, I mean, other people who might have uh, Tourette's and, and have some, 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 you know, audible ticks or, or visible ticks, you know, maybe, maybe it, it is a bad scenario. Maybe you don't want to take public speaking, but I was able to get through it. And I think that that might be a, a good thing to pass along is, you know, everyone's going to be throwing different curveballs in life. And, and as long as you can get through it and know that you can get through it, um, everyone's going to be successful.
The Tourette Association of America is the premier nonprofit working to raise awareness, advance research, and provide ongoing support for those with Tourette syndrome or a tic disorder. With a network of over 130 chapters, support groups, and centers of excellence, the TAA engages with communities across the nation in an effort to provide tools, webinars, workshops, and support for all seeking assistance. As a primary sponsor of Tourette's podcast, the TAA supports authentic conversations showcasing the diverse representation of the Tourette community. To learn more, go to Tourette.org. That's T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E dot org. The Tourette Association of America. Uncontrollable. Unstoppable. Have you uh, had ways of managing your tics? Like, did, did it ever come to that point where you're like, I, I need some sort of, you know, some, some kind of input or a medication or, you know, just some way of, of seeking, you know, some general relief? Yeah. As a kid, when I was first diagnosed, um, you know, my parents kind of put me through um, um, kind of a, a screening, almost like a screening process where, um you know, these, these doctors would make a recommendation on, you know, which, which maybe medication or drug or pill that I should, I should maybe try out to see if it helps with, with my tics. I mm-hmm. remember taking pills. I remember uh, putting on patches on my shoulders and um, all of them made me zombie-like. Yeah. So it was very difficult for me to um, be engaged in school, um, continue to have, you know, uh, uh, friendships and even just conversations during school is very difficult I remember so you know my you know I kudos to my parents I mean they never gave up on on you know what I was going through so we we just said you know mm-hmm. what it's not working let's give it up we can try something else um you know we, we really didn't try anything outside of medication I think as I grew older and out of that I I started to teach myself on how to suppress but yeah, early on, we, we definitely tried medication and, and, and patches and, and they just did not work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, quality of life is is really the ultimate when it comes to something like this or with anything, really. But getting to a place where you feel comfortable, kind of you being you, you doing you, th- th- that's that's where I can't place any judgment on. You know, I, I'm, I may have Tourette syndrome, but I'm going to kind of push this back however I can so I can get to where I want to be. Um, same time, it's really, really great advice to, uh, to know that you're going to survive these, these difficult things that you go through, whether it's, you know, uh, public speaking or you know, whatever the challenge may be. Uncomfortable situations definitely set off my tics. I mean, that, that's definitely something and, th- and that impacts my quality of life. If I have a series of painful tics or ones that are just kind of holding me back from doing, you know, quote unquote, normal things. But I don't know. I mean, ha- have, have you had to, uh, a- apply this in your adulthood, uh, any sort of any exercises or anything like that, that, that sort of help you to kind of get through and accept? I was always in sports as a kid. And I felt like that was a great way for me to kind of let out some of the, the pent up energy or pent up stress that I had in life and, and yeah, for uh, sure. dealing with school and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I played a lot of different sports. Um, I didn't, I didn't, uh, carry those on into college. I had a uh, part-time job that, you know, I was, I was, paying my car insurance, paying my cell phone bills. I had, I had to make some sort of money while I was in college. And, and that was my way to, you know, get out there and, um, have an, have some sort of stability, right. Um, sometimes mm-hmm. in college you can, you can, you can experiment <laughs> and, and get into, you know, some bad scenarios. So I was, I was, you know, fortunate enough to, to make that right decision and, and stick with a part-time job and, um, you know, and still do some sports on the side in college. So I, I, I felt like that was pretty helpful. So uh, who, who in your life does know about this? I, I think you had mentioned when we had uh, spoken earlier that, uh, you know, you, you have had difficulty in uh, communicating it with people. And, and again, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier of, you know, who deserves to know, you know, whose business is it really but yours? But I mean, is, is it a, is it still a pretty small portion of people, you know, who, who, who know this about you? Yeah. So my parents, um, I have a sibling, my brother, he knows, uh, my wife knows, I, I, I know I told her early on in our relationship, but it really hasn't come up since. And, and I think that's just a credit to how I kind of control my tics. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, but there are some scenarios that, you know, come out where, where maybe I don't, uh, I don't do a good job listening or I don't do a good job paying attention. And, you know, that might be attributed to me just being um, preoccupied with something else. I don't quite know, but, you know, OCD does, does have some issues and, and dealing, you know, being, being a husband, being a, uh, a son, being a parent, you know, I, I have two little ones and um, mm. it's, it's a great experience, but also very challenging and being very patient <laughs> uh, when they were toddlers, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're seven and five right now. And um, they're kind of out of that uh, toddler stage, so uh, it's a little easier to be a little more patient with them. But um, yeah, I haven't I haven't told my kids yet. I don't think they're quite at that age to really understand what that means. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, you know, eventually I will have that conversation with them and, and share my experiences. And you know, I was diagnosed when I was I think six, so I'm kind of okay. right in between your your kids' ages. Um, right. It doesn't sound like they've exhibited any symptoms that you. Uh, can tell have they or I mean and, and you can completely no. uh, bypass this question if you want no they I, they haven't um, and actually you know in just doing research over the years I know it's still kind of an unknown but it could be hereditary I've heard it could skip generations I've heard that too so you know one thing I can remember on my family side was my my uh, my grandmother's sister which would be my great aunt um, you know, later on in her life, she, she had a lot of, uh, visible ticks. So a lot of, you know, excessive blinking. Um, and I remember my father saying, you know, you never know, you know, your, your great aunt probably won't get tested at this age, but she might, she might've carried that on and, and passed it on to, to you. You never know. But, um, yeah, that was, I thought that was interesting. And, and I think, you know, being a teenager, seeing my great aunt, have some of those, um, blinking issues that, that I had as a kid. Um, Hmm. you know, I don't know if it was a little comfort knowing that someone else that I knew had it growing up. I didn't know anyone else that had Tourette's and it was, it was a little challenging growing up in the nineties, early nineties when I was diagnosed because there just wasn't a social, social media platform that I could use without having to go in person and seeing people you know, firsthand and what they're going through. So, you know, I know we talked about this um, <clears throat> before, but, you know, growing mm-hmm. up in this day and age, I think would, would be a, a, a blessing to have those, those resources and have those opportunities to share your experiences. I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I was diagnosed in the mid 1980s and that that's before, you know, even I'm sure there were Tourette's jokes at the time, but just as far as the public consciousness of, of Tourette syndrome as a, as a, you know, a set of words, and this is what this means, wasn't really there yet. And, um, you know, it makes me think about the people who, uh, were diagnosed. We, we talked with, uh, the late, uh, Steve Bachner, um, Steve Bachner a while back, he fought through it in a time where I guess people just assumed that he was on, on some sort of, uh, illegal drug or something. I, I think I remember him saying right. that on an episode of 2020 where or th- there were people that's right. They were interviewing people kind of a man on the street sort of thing. And they were saying, what do you think is wrong with this guy? And they're like, well, he's clearly on cocaine or, you know, it's just interesting. Th- those, th- those kinds of judgments. Um, and you know, him getting kicked out of a, a, a Wendy's, uh, you know, hamburgers restaurant because they're like, you know, we, we don't want you here. You know, you're upsetting people. And right. he was just ticking. And so, so I think about the, not that, you know, this is, this makes everything easy for everybody who has to read any, uh, these days, but it is a really, really amazing resource to have social media and be able to just go on Instagram and, and hashtag Tourette or Tourette syndrome and just find people who are your age, people who look like you maybe have the same, you know, kinds of ticks as you, or, you know, it's just, it's really, really great to find those connections. Um, and I've, I've wondered what it would be like if, if I had those connections when I was a little kid, which were pretty scarce. You know, I remember thinking about, you know, okay, I, I must be the only one to Tourette's. So I remember my father um, giving me a, a basketball card as a kid and said, hey, I, this guy has Tourette's syndrome. I mean, you know, it was always great to see someone else mm-hmm. that had what I had and knew what I was going through. Um, I, I can't remember the NBA player, but um, Chris you know, Jackson, I, just I think uh, him giving me that uh, Abdul Rauf. Abdul Roof, that was it. Yes, that yeah. was it. Thank you for <laughs> bringing that up. But <laughs> yes, I remember that. And and my father gave me his card. And, and I remember thinking like, yeah, wow, there is someone else out there that has what I have and, and knows 
you know, what I'm dealing with. So, um, again, you know, this day and age with social media, I think it would have been great to mm-hmm. have him be more vocal and, and talk about it a little bit more on a platform and, and see what he was going through. But, um, you know, we didn't have that opportunity. We didn't have that resource as, as kids. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the only person I knew about when I was a kid was Jim Eisenreich. I mean, there, there may be some exceptions there may be a couple other people, but, um, but as far as just, you know, like someone who could be a hero to me, he was a you know professional baseball player, played on the Kansas City Royals uh, for the Twins, for the Phillies. And he was good. And I remember meeting right. him at a Tourette conference as cool as he could be. And that just stuck with oh, me. He, he autographed a few things. And like, I, I swear, I felt so much more confident after meeting him, uh, at least, you know, for, for that time period, because, you know, here I am in my little world collecting baseball cards, like, bam there's a card of a guy who has the same thing that I have. He's a lot older than me. And I wasn't really thinking about it this way at the time, but kind of like with Steve Backner, how, you know, he, he came up with this in a time where it was really publicly misunderstood. And, um, right. and so, yeah, just, just knowing you have a posse of people, you know, today would be, you know, th- there are a lot of um, people of celebrity status, you know, Tim Howard and, and it's, it's pretty great right. that um, they've worked with the TAA before and that, you know, it may not be like their daily thing, their daily grind of like dread advocacy, but it's really, really cool because they're making it work and they're successful. Right. And it's just, it's a really cool thing to see. Yeah. It's awareness, right? I mean, the more people that understand it and, and can somewhat understand what everyone is explaining and what's going on in their, in their brain and, and how they have to suppress and all those sort of things. I think it, it, it it's a great thing that, um, you know, whether, whether the athletes or, or musicians or, you know, CEOs that have, have Tourette's that, that are being more vocal these days than they have been in the past because it is more accepted um, than it has been. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's, I think that's great that we're starting to see some celebrities that, that are, 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 are speaking up and, and talking more freely and openly about it. Yeah. And it also helps to, to know, especially with some of the recent scientific research that, you know, it's it, our experiences with Tourette's syndrome may be maybe rare and very individual. Um, I don't know other people in my day to day who, who also deal with it to my knowledge, but with the recent scientific research, you know, pointing out that this is not by the numbers, a rare disorder. It's so many people live with it. It's just a, a matter of, uh, you know, coming to terms with it, realizing that there are other people out there and, uh, you know, just, just creating a, a comfortable zone to, uh, to, to feel okay about having it, you know, whether you want to talk about it publicly or not, you know, just, just to feel okay about having it. Because again, like quality of life is just such a bottom line, um, for me, you know, whether right. people know about my Tourette or not, I just want to live a, a happy, healthy life where I can achieve the things I want to achieve. And, you know, but that feeling of having a posse is, is, is huge in that. And I imagine that especially so if you're young and you're really, you're, you're starting to learn your world and where Tourette syndrome fits in. Right. Yeah. And I, I can't remember if it was season seven when you were talking about uh, TikTok and and all these cases of these, um, mm-hmm. you know, these these girls and these 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 women that are coming in and saying that, that they're having a lot of issues. And I think yeah. the more research we're doing, the more research these doctors are doing and starting to identify um, or, or putting together a list of attributes and how to identify who has Tourette's and who doesn't. Um, you know, in the nineties, I don't know, maybe it was one in every 10,000 people had it. Um, now right. it seems like it's more like one in every hundred. Hey, it's Ben cutting in real quick, just to update the numbers. One in 50 school age children are impacted by Tourette syndrome or a persistent tick disorder. Again, one in 50 school age children are impacted by TS or a persistent tick disorder. All right, back to it. So I think the more that we're again doing these these research um, um, things and, and and understanding, you know, who who might have Tourette's, who might have these tics, um, and identifying those people and, and really start to give them the resources and how to deal with it, um, I, I think is great. Is there anything that you're still kind of seeking out with Tourette or how to how to live with uh, the effects that it's had on you in your life or? I mean, everyone has it in the back of their mind who has, who has Tourette's like, if I could just take one, one pill to get rid of it, (laughs) um, (laughs) you know, I'd be better off. But I think, I think having Tourette's has kind of shaped me into the person that I am today. So I I don't know if I would want to change it as a kid. I don't know if 
you know, being, being an eight year old or a seven year old, if I wanted to take that, that pill to get rid of it, I, I don't know, looking back mm-hmm. at it now, you know, I think it's, it's kind of forming into the person that I am today. And, um, you know, being, being accepted, um, is, is big and, and accepting the fact that you have Tourette's and, and knowing how to deal with it in certain scenarios, you know, using those resources that are available to you, um, is, is extremely helpful. Um, it, it, and it, and of course it is still uncomfortable for us to talk about it. Um, that, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to sit here and, and, and talk about it a little bit, but, but I know that it might help, help others. And, um, I, I find some gratitude in, in, in sharing that, um, you know, to, to other people who might have Tourette's or, or might have ticks that maybe they haven't been diagnosed with Tourette's, um, don't give up, you know, talk to, talk to your loved ones, talk to your close, close friends and family, um, and, and just share some of the things that you're going with, because the more people who you talk to and, and maybe can help you, um, you're better off and, and, you know, always, always, um, always try and try and be proactive and, 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 mm-hmm. you know, try and try and think of the best scenario in certain s- situations. And, um, you know, don't, don't go down the path that, you know, of, of, of going with drugs or anything like that or alcohol, because it's, it's a, it's a very, yeah. uh, very dark road. And, and I would just highly advise not going down that path and, um, you know, find a hobby, find something that you really love doing and, and really try and excel at it because it's, it's a great way to, um, get rid of some of that stress and get, get rid of some of that, um, you know, pent up energy. Uh, I, I like to, uh, I like to do yard work. That seems to be a, a really hmm. good, uh, way for me to get rid of some of the stress and, and energy that I have pent up in me. Uh, um, it's a good way for me to kind of, uh, turn my brain off and kind of unplug and just, uh, stick at the ta- stick with the task at hand and, um, yeah. you know, cutting lawn, pulling weeds, um, you know, organizing things in your garage or your shred, um, you know, those sort of things. So find a hobby, find a hobby that, uh, you enjoy doing and, and, and don't, don't just stick to one hobby, try other things too, because you might find there are some other hobbies that help you with your ticks and, and maybe help, help suppress it without, having to hold your breath or, you know, closing your eyes or, or clenching your jaw or something, something of that nature. So, um, yeah, that, I, you know, that would be some advice that I would, I would pass on for sure. Yeah. That, that's important it is, and the, the thing about the magic pill and, you know, like taking, you know, would you, would you, if you had the choice to cure your Tourette right now and, you know, uh, I, when I was a kid, you know, I've thought about that, um, you know, how my answer would have changed over time when I was a kid, I'm sure I'm sure I would have said like, yeah, like get it off me. Uh, Let's, let's cure this stuff. I don't want it Uh, as an adult and seeing, yeah, how it has shaped my life and how it has paired me up with things that I learned that I'm good at. um, You know, who knows what my life would have been like if, if I, if I never had this, but it it definitely has shaped how I've gone about things, how I get into things, you know, how, how I compose myself. Um, and, And yeah. And finding the things I enjoy that, that help my Tourette, that, I'm glad they helped my Tourette, but I'm also glad incidentally that I I enjoy these activities and you know, it's, it's something that can kind of lower my stress overall. And I can feel that feeling of satisfaction that I created something that I like or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Whether it's doing yard work or whether it's drawing and painting or, you know, and, and also I I spent so much time by myself when I was a kid, um, you know, just kind of in my room doing my thing. And maybe some degree of that was unhealthy where I should have been out a lot more, but those definitely were valuable times for me in shaping, sure. you know, what I guess my skills were. And, um, and I, I attribute so much of this to Tourette syndrome and, and just the way my brain works and how it thinks. And maybe the way I, I arrive at answers, the sense of empathy that I can feel for other people, things I don't know if I would have at least not to this degree without it. So it's, you know, it's one of these things where you can find positives in the negative. I, I can't see myself taking the magic pill anymore. <laughs> Because it's just, it's so ingrained and I like so many aspects of it. And I also understand there are some people who have tics that they really don't like and it's, it's really been heavy on their life. And if someone, you know, in their adult life does want to commit uh, and say like, okay, yeah, let's do the cure. And for people listening, there's no cure, but hypothetically, if the cure existed, I wouldn't necessarily place judgment on anybody because again, it's quality of life and it's what you want. Um, 
I, I wouldn't accuse anybody of being like a traitor to, to Tourette syndrome or anything like that if they would take the pill, so to speak. But don't give up is just such great advice because you're going to find something that works. Right. And knowing that you're not alone, um, you know, there's a little bit of satisf- satisf- satisfaction there. Um, again, back to, you know, my, our conversation earlier about me growing up and I really didn't know anyone else, but knowing, you know, now that there are others that are going through what you were going through, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's, I don't know, it's, 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 it's hard to explain, but just knowing that other people have that condition that can relate is, um, is important, you know, getting, getting diagnosed isn't a bad thing it's it just it just puts a label on it but it doesn't really change who you are and um just just know that there are other people that are going through it and that you know there are resources for you Thanks for listening. Thanks so much to Dan for his time with us and all he brought to the conversation. I'd love your feedback. If this episode produced any questions or comments in your mind, then please send to Tourette's podcast at gmail.com, or you can use the contact form at Tourette's podcast.com. I do read everything that comes in. I'm not always able to reply immediately, but your messages are always delivered and always read. You can also go to the Tourette's podcast discussion group on Facebook run by the amazing Sophia in the UK. Thanks always to her for what she does there. And also to remind, uh, this is a closed discussion group. We talked about this last week. This is a closed discussion group. So you have to request to join. And when you do that, there's some questions to answer to essentially keep the bots and the bad faith people out of the way, out of the group. So please make sure you answer those questions so we can let you in. It's an awesome place and it's a perfect place to bring any reflections you might have from this episode. Tourette's podcast is sponsored by the Tourette Association of America, online at Tourette.org, now in its 50th year as an organization. And don't forget that gala coming up, November 10th, Tourette.org, the Tourette Gala in New York City. You can find details at Tourette.org or click the link I will include in the show notes with this episode at Tourette'sPodcast.com. We will leave you to it. We'll be back soon with another episode of Tourette's Podcast. Thank you for listening. This is Ben.